Shimona Braverman. Oh my word. We really do have a live one here, don't we? Now, she is on the rampage, to say the least, whipping up bile, hatred and division, as is her want. That is her modus operandi. Nothing new there. But she's taken that to a whole new level. Basically, she's trying to use the movement against the mass slaughter of innocent people in Palestine with the direct complicity of our government uh, to further that particular kink of hers. I think we can put it that way. Many say she's trying to get sacked so she's going to be a martyr to the right-wing cause and then become leader of the Conservative Party. Whatever. Whether she's leader or not, the Conservative Party belongs to her now. She's won the battle of ideas. It dances to her tune, the Conservatives, that is. Now, she's penned an article for the Times newspaper about the protest this Saturday against the massacre, which she tried to get banned. Unlucky, Sweller, That failed. Dry your eyes, mate. Now, this article is unhinged, even by her standards, and I'm going to go through it and just show how unhinged it is and expose these arguments for what they are. Now, she speaks about the long-established traditions of freedom of expression, including freedom of assembly, the right to protest in, in public as a cornerstone of our democracy. Um, that is why peaceful marches are never banned, and even controversial and disruptive ones are policed rather than blocked. I agree with her. That's the only part of the article we're going to agree on about freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and the right to process in public being a cornerstone of our democracy. These rights, by the way, were won. They were fought for at huge cost and sacrifice by ordinary people who defied authority, who defied the likes of Suella Braverman throughout history. They were not given to us as acts of beneficence, of generosity, of charity by the powerful. They didn't wake up one day and think, oh, let's give the people the right to protest. We had to fight for them. And it's so important that we know that. Now, when she talks about peaceful marches never being banned or controversial, firstly, what a load of hypocrisy, given what she has done, for example, with the policing bill, is try to drive through repressive legislation, or has done repressive legislation, which cracks down on the right to protest. Now, that was under her predecessor, but she supported it, and she's continued to support and enforce laws which crack down on the basic right of peaceful protest. She doesn't believe in it. I mean, the government have even introduced legislation which cracks down on protests if they are too noisy. Protests are, by definition, noisy. They don't believe in the right to protest, and any claim to the contrary is a nonsense. Now, she says the way the, war, the law works is clear. If a chief constable believes there is a serious risk of disorder, which the police will struggle to contain, he or she can ask the Home Secretary to ban a march. Now, unlucky for her, there is no serious risk of disorder. That's the problem. If there was, the Metropolitan Police would ban it. Because the Metropolitan Police, despite the fact she and her allies are trying to portray the Metropolitan Police as some sort of den of leftiness and woke... They don't like protesters. I know that because I've been on so many protesters, protests, and the Metropolitan Police often crack down, I have done, in the most brutal way possible within their powers. They don't like these protests. The point is, if they had an excuse, if they thought they had intelligence to justify banning the protest, they would do it like that in a heartbeat. But the fact is, they would, if they do it without reason, they'll be dragged through the courts and they will lose. They will have to, they'll be... A, a court, a process, they get taken to court, and then they have to explain in front of the court why they banned the protest. They have to offer the evidence in public for why they did so. If the evidence isn't there, they are buggered. And that's the point. The police are not standing their ground against Suella Braverman and the government because they suddenly have become uh, uber liberals who believe in democratic freedoms. They don't think they have a leg to stand on. And the reason they don't think they have a leg to stand on is because they do not. Now, she goes on, there is a debate to be had about whether other considerations should play a part in such decisions. Are some public displays so offensive they deserve to be banned? Is there a level of disruption into the life of a city that is too great to justify a demonstration? Nevertheless, the law as it stands makes it clear that marches should always, always be permitted. Well, it's clear what's happening here. What she means is the existing law is wrong because she wants to clamp down on the right to protest. That's the debate she wants. Should we basically be allowed to protest? That's the debate she wants. She wants a police state. That's what she's hinting at. That's not hyperbole. Clearly, she wants the police to have sweeping powers to just scrap protests on a whim. I mean, this talk about if a protest is deemed so offensive. All this time for the last few years, the left has been accused of shutting down free speech by trying to silence things that cause us offence. That is literally the entire moral, sorry, the whole basis 
of the moral panic about free speech and so-called cancel culture. Now, it is a nonsense. It generally means powerful people who think free speech means saying anything you want without any consequence, that no one can even criticise you because that's an attack on your free speech. So they scream at us, don't they, from their newspaper columns, TV studios, from radio interviews, from book deals. We're silenced, we're silenced. A megaphone in our ears about how silenced these powerful people are. But often it's just because their latest column, baiting refugees or trans people, or another largely voiceless and marginalised minority, got quote tweeted by a teenager on Twitter who has rightly embarrassed them by being much younger but more informed and less bigoted than they are. So let's just be honest. They want to shut down our protest in solidarity with the Palestinian people because they are offended by it. I get that. Protests are always going to cause offence to the powerful. That's kind of the point. We're using our collective power to challenge the powerful. In this case, because the British government is directly aiding and abetting a massacre. They are arming and supporting Israel as it slaughters well over 10,000 people, including well over 4,000 children. That is an underestimate. Another human rights group, an independent human rights group, believes it's well over 13,000 because, and I'm sorry to have to say this, the figures don't include decomposing bodies buried in the rubble currently being eaten by starving dogs. Now, that is not a pleasant thing for me to have to say. But if the reality of this horror is sanitised, then we are not going to turn public opinion around in terms of they are on our side in support of a ceasefire, but we want people to have an urgency about what we do to force the government to shift their position. Now, many more will die, not just because of missiles. Likely, most will die of other causes. This is a human-made humanitarian catastrophe. No clean water, lack of food, medicine, collapsing healthcare system, disease, untreated illnesses, pregnant women, women without medical care, as well as cancer patients, those with underlying serious health conditions we could go on. Now, if I was being accused of being an accomplice to that kind of horror, however factually grounded it might be, I'd be offended. Damn right you'd be offended, wouldn't you? Now, the way to avoid this scenario is simply not to be an accomplice to mass murder. But alas, Braverman has made a rather different life decision. Now, if we went down Braverman's route, virtually all protests would be banned because some powerful people would find them offensive. Now, she goes on to speak of Hamas is atrocity, which should be rightly condemned, I have, over and over again. And as a nation, we united in doing so. It's just many of us, in fact most of us, don't believe the answer is collective punishment and killing at least 10 times as many innocent civilians as those Israeli civilians killed on October the 7th. And indeed, it's likely to be more than 13 times and indeed many more times to come. She says there have been dignified vigils in London held by Britain's Jewish community, but that has not that is not what has tested our capacity to maintain public order. These vigils are absolutely crucial. Of course they should be defended. They are different from protests, which are about using our collective power to advance demands, rather than quite rightly, specifically about mourning the dead, including those so brutally murdered by Hamas on the 7th of October. She goes on, it's the pro-Palestinian movement that has mobilised tens of thousands of angry demonstrators and marched them through London every weekend. From the start, these events have been problematic, not just because of violence around the fringes, but because of the highly offensive content of chants, posters and stickers. This is not a time for naivety. We have seen with our eyes that terrorists have been valorised, Israel has been demonised as Nazis and Jews have been threatened with further massacres. What a load of cry and lies, load of nonsense, load of gibberish, load of bollocks from Suella Braverman. Now, hundreds of thousands of people have taken to the streets. On the biggest demonstration, in which up to half a million people marched, there were how many arrests? A thousand arrests? 500 arrests? 100 arrests? 50 arrests? 10 arrests. That's a lower arrest rate than the average football match. Now, <laughs> if you go to these protests and see them with your own eyes rather than rely on the deceitful claims of politicians and media outlets you'll see something more akin to a family day out you'll see people from all backgrounds marching together muslims christians non-believers hello and jewish people a crucial point jewish peace protesters have always been a crucial part of every demonstration they have directly organized their own protests since this all began there is a jewish bloc meeting this saturday at the simon bolivar statue in belgrave square it will be a significant size, that block. When she says violence on the fringes are nonsense. Any violence at these peace marches will be lower than the sorts of violence you routinely get on London streets. In fact, they almost certainly lower these protester rates of violence simply by clearing the streets and flooding them with peace protesters. Now, she says offensive chants, posters and stickers. I went up the length and breadth of these protests and I did not see them. And I know what an offensive... People go, oh, well, you don't know what that... Can, you probably you don't think an actually offensive chant or pro post or sticker is offensive. That's not true. 
and well aware that we need desperately to have protests that offer reassurance and inclusion to Jewish people in this country and beyond. The point is, they were crawling these protests with cops with a mandate to arrest anyone showing support for Hamas or Hezbollah, and they couldn't find them either. Now, there's a, a panic, a moral panic about the chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, an intentionally misconstrued phrase, because the vast majority simply mean that Palestinians will be free from the river to the sea. And that means, for example, either a two-state solution, where you have an independent, viable Palestinian state based on the pre-1967 borders, or instead you have a one-state secular solution with one vote, one citizen. Now, that might seem far off, but it's or, or not viable in the here and now, but it's a legitimate thing to argue for. But that's the point. They're trying to misconstrue these sorts of arguments. Now, she claims Jews were threatened with further massacres on these demonstrations. Such a vile, baseless, nonsense, nonsense claim. And actually a dangerous claim because it's whipping up fear. It makes people scared. You shouldn't throw these things around without solid evidence. Now, she goes on, each weekend has been worse than the previous one. Last Saturday in central London, police were attacked with fireworks. Train services were brought uh, to a halt by demonstrators and poppy sellers were mobbed and prevented from raising funds for veterans. Now, last Saturday, there wasn't a nationally organised demo. People were told to take part in their own local activities. As I mean, no one was injured in these, by the way. It's so important to say this. The few who threw fireworks... Uh, as, as she describes it. Well, I don't, to be blunt here, what you get in nationally organised protest is you have stewards, which make sure the protest happens in an orderly and a peaceful way. If you ban protests, then you still get these other protests, which don't have stewards organising them. And now, as somebody travelled that day, this last Saturday from London, Euston, which was full of protesters, to Manchester Piccadilly, also full of protesters. My journey wasn't impeded. As for poppy sellers, trying to portray protesters as threats to poppy sellers is a baseless nonsense, but also train stations are often crowded at peak times. I mean, you get football matches. Are they deemed a mortal threat to poppy sellers? A lot of people go on these protests wear poppies. Now she goes on, as we approach a particularly significant weekend of the life of our nation, one which calls for respect and commemoration, the hate marches, a phrase I do not reside from, intend to use Armistice Day to pray through London in yet another show of strength. Hate marches, there she goes. She's the hate preacher, the most notorious hate preacher in the country, who describes immigration as a mortal threat to civilization, called migrants a hurricane, which is a natural disaster which kills people in large numbers, uh, goes on about numbers of kids born to foreign-born mothers in order to scare people. Uh, now, you know, she's, she's the one full of hatred. I think we need to be clear about this. As for Armistice Day, the march starts two hours after the two-minute silence. It goes nowhere near the cenotaph. We march from Hyde Park to the US Embassy. On Armistice Day, I'll be remembering my great-great-uncle. He was mowed down on the Somme at the age of 19, the youngest of seven. My great-granddad, he died in the Royal Air Force in 1942 during that war. My granddad, who was in the Merchant Navy, which had the second highest level of attrition after the RAF, um, his boat was sunk twice. He survived on an open boat for 10 days. I'm remembering all those killed in wars, including those who have been killed right now, as were many who will be marching. Many others have relative lost in war. It's not a, a rare thing, is it, for British uh, people living in this country to have lost relatives in war? And there'll be service personnel who will be marching. I know of several. Now, on, you know, this idea on Armistice Day, when it falls on a Saturday, that the nation stops, that's never happened. What better way to mark a day on which war ended that than to call for another war to end as harry patch the last surviving tommy put it war is organized murder and nothing else who could look at the mass graves of gaza and conclude anything else as for show of strength we protest every saturday that's the tradition of protests it's on a saturday because people have working kids so they can't take part otherwise you know and people don't generally do it on a sunday but we can't do it on, we can't do it on, on remembrance sunday i think everyone would agree on that we're showing the strength of opinion just three percent oppose a permanent ceasefire the same number who believe the earth is flat. Now she goes on. Here we reach the heart of the matter. I do not believe these marches are merely a cry for help for Gaza. They are an assertion of primacy by certain groups, particularly Islamists of the kind we are more used to seeing in Northern Ireland. Also disturbingly reminiscent of Ulster are the reports that some of Saturday's march group organisers have links to terrorist groups, including Hamas. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened there then, Suella? We truly have gone off on the deep end, haven't we? You deranged lunatic. Firstly, what comparison is she trying to make here in Northern Ireland? Does she know anything about Northern Ireland? An assertion of primacy by certain groups. This is this only makes sense if she's comparing protesters, what, with the loyalists or in Georgia and their intentionally provocative marches through Catholic or nationalist areas based on sectarianism. Is she doing that? She wants a war with the Northern Ireland unionists that the Tories have always backed. Bit of a weird flex there, Suella. 
But the crux of the matter is this. She's trying to whip up bigotry against Muslims. That's the only interpretation that I think is valid. That's what's happening here. That many Muslims take part is not surprising because many Muslims are currently being slaughtered. Not exclusively, Christians too. The Christian community going back to the fourth century in Gaza is at risk of being destroyed forever. Now she wants us to think Muslims are dangerous, violent, disloyal extremists on these protests, but they're marching against violence. That's the point. They're marching against violence that's backed by the government. They're marching against mass death aided and abetted by Braverman and her colleagues. They come with their families. You have elderly British Muslims, you have little kids. They're driven as families, as citizens, by the same motives as anyone else. They don't like this violence and this massacre. It's a disgusting attempt by Braverman to use Gaza to whip up conflict, to divide our communities, and to turn us against our neighbours. And here's the thing. There are extremists marching this Saturday. The far right, they're mobilising. She's not saying anything about them because she's fueling them. They back Israel's mass slaughter. They like Suella Braverman. They see us those of us marching against mass murder in exactly the same way as Braverman sees us. She's giving them legitimacy. She's encouraging them to see us as fair game. And do you know what? I'll say this. If anything happens to any of us at the hands of these people, then that hate preacher, Suella Braverman, squatting in the Home Office, I'll tell you this, mark my words, we will hold you personally responsible and accountable for anything that happens. She then claims preposterously, unfortunately, there's a perception that senior police officers pay, play favourites when it comes to protesters. During COVID, why was it that lockdown objectives were given no quarter by public order police, yet Black Lives Matters demonstrators were enabled, allowed to break rules and even greeted with officers taking the knee? Are you on crack? I mean, I'm just playing a game of Occam's razor here and working out the simplest likeliest explanation for this insanity. The Met f has repeatedly been found, um, including by a recent government uh, inquiry, to be institutionally racist and institutionally homophobic and misogynist. You think the Met, the Metropolitan Police, are riddled with sympathy for BLM. It's a lie. A report in 2020 found that the Metropolitan Police's policing of the BLM protest was itself institutionally racist, including excessive force, including horse charges, one of which rendered a woman unconscious, baton charges, pepper spray and violent arrest was commonly reported and well evidenced. Why are you lying, Suella? Right wing and nationalist um, protesters, she goes on to say, who engage in aggression are rightly met with a stern response, yet pro-Palestinian mobs displaying almost identical behaviour are largely ignored even when they're clearly breaking the law. Now, she go this is a load of gibberish. The police have always come down like a ton of bricks on the left's protests. Now, she, she talks about how play, um, football fans are treated. Football fans can be treated really badly. Working class fans throughout history treated terribly by the police. But she's playing divide and rule here. She's not trying to make police less severe on anyone. She wants them to be more severe and harder. That's what she wants. Now, she goes on that if, if the march goes ahead this weekend, the public will expect to see an assertive and proactive approach to any displays of hate, breaches of conditions and general disorder. There we have it. She wants the cops to overreact. She wants them to cause confrontation. We know in previous protests things go downhill when the cops behave like this. She's trying to whip up bile and hatred and division. Now, the far right may end up doing her job for her. But look, they're losing the battle for public opinion. They know most of us back a ceasefire. They're trying to turn the tables, to turn the world upside down, that the real extremists are the ones who oppose the mass murder of little children. The real moderates are the ones who support it. It's not true. It's the other way around. So we should respond to Suella in exactly the right way. We should turn out in great numbers this week, this Saturday. We bring our friends, our relatives, our loved ones, our colleagues, our acquaintances, just drag random people off the streets. Defy her and this government and come full of peace and determination to stand by the Palestinian people in their darkest hour. Please like, subscribe, do support us on patreon.com forward slash I'll see you